Welcome to this edition of the Mathematics Video Series. Today's topic is on data collection and ethical practices in research and experimentation. To start off, society has no universal set of moral and ethical principles, although events over the last century have provided widely accepted guidelines. Therefore, we cannot assume that every individual has the same moral code of conduct. Religion, culture, and perspective vary, which has led to conflict between groups and questionable individual behaviors. So what is acceptable conduct in research? The golden rule says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This is important to keep in mind when deciding to administer an experiment, experimental drug or withhold one that could cure a person, particularly when human subjects and the much talked about animal cruelty in testing products, rules must be set. This is typically done by an IRB or Institutional Review Board that is charged with deciding if the treatment being given in a research project is acceptable and if human or animal subjects are even necessary. There is an Institutional Review Board on every research university campus that is responsible for oversight of all intervention or interaction with human participants, including interviews, surveys, observations, treatment, and procedures. All information that is not public must remain confidential. The IRB typically approves projects for one year, upholding the protection of research subjects' rights and welfare. No research can be conducted, surveys administered, or data collected until the IRB approval is granted. When considering the implications of research, the Hippocratic Oath said by doctors before they begin to practice medicine, first, do no harm, is a good starting point. Ask yourself, what harm could be done by this research? The list of harm that could be done is extensive and would require a much longer video. However, some particularly egregious examples include the Tuskegee experiment, a study on syphilis patients that lasted from 1932 to 1972 by the United States Public Health Service. Rural African American men with syphilis thought they were receiving free health care from the United States government. 600 poor sharecroppers from Alabama were enrolled in the study. Of these, 399 men had already contracted syphilis before the study began. The rest did not have the disease. In return for participating, the United States government gave them health care, food, and insurance. The researchers did not treat the patients even when in 1947 it was shown that penicillin was an effective cure. The disease was left to progress until death as a way to watch what happened to these men who had the disease. Many wives and children also contracted syphilis. In 1936, a group of Japanese army researchers called Unit 731 tested biological and chemical weapons on humans, mostly in China, which at that time was occupied by Japan. They wanted to test human bodies to various conditions, poisons, and diseases. Researchers infected humans with bubonic plague to determine the effects on the human body. In order to ensure that the bodies did not decompose, they dissected their victims alive and, since they did not want an anesthetic to corrupt their results, no painkillers were given. They also cut off their limbs and organs of humans in order to see what would happen when they sewed them back onto their body. Tests were also done with animal blood transfusions and determinations of how much burning, x-rays, and poisons the body could withstand before dying. Biological weapons were tested on villages with estimates of up to 200,000 dead. Most of these scientists were given complete immunity from prosecution in exchange for access to their findings. Slightly afterward, dur during World War II, Joseph Mengele stands out as a Nazi doctor who performed outrageous experiments on people in concentration camps. With millions captive, there were plenty from which he could choose. Previously inconceivable tests were done on the prisoners, including the famous twin studies, where twins were used to compare what would happen if treatments were done on each one. 
Horrific experiments were conducted, removing eyes, fingers, and other body parts just to see how long it would take to bleed out. Joseph Mengele tested various types of chemicals on the skin to see what would happen to them over time and exposed people to extreme temperatures and radiation. In some cases, he infected prisoners with diseases to monitor the results. The shock of these experiments and widely criticized actions emphasized the importance to researchers to create a general code of ethics. In 1961, Stanley Milgram conducted an experiment on 40 individuals to test their responses to the pressure of authority. Milgram wanted to know how average people during World War II who could have killed so many of their fellow citizens. He divided the subjects into pairs. One was given the designation as the authority figure who delivered an electronic shock to a second participant who answered questions. If they answered the questions incorrectly, one participant was to receive a shock. The shock increased in magnitude as the experiment progressed. As it turned out, the one supposedly receiving the shock was situated in an adjoining room and was actually an actor. The results were surprising. Despite cries and screams, many subjects continued administering voltages that would have killed the other participant, with voltages up to 450 volts, the highest amount possible. 26 of the 40 participants delivered a lethal shock, although many seemed conflicted in doing so. Another example was the continued sales and use of the drug thalidomide which was prescribed to pregnant mothers in the late 1950s and early 1960s to reduce morning sickness. Once considered a miracle drug, it was at one time as popular as aspirin. However, the result that it produced was about 10,000 babies that were grossly malformed. Half did not live past the first year. The German company continued to sell the drug denying the evidence presented. So why should we focus on ethics and research? Because of the psychological and physical harm done to subjects and the need to have standards that everyone follows. Some basic ethical principles include informed consent, which is the idea that everyone should be aware of the treatment administered and agree to what will happen during the research and provide consent. Also, it is expected that all information will remain confidential. Researchers must not emit sample data that does not support their case and should never fabricate results. They should not infuse bias in their research. Also, and equally important, the well-being of the subjects must take precedence over the benefit to society. So to summarize, principles that should be adhered to include honesty in all communications to subjects and in reporting results objectivity to avoid bias, integrity to keep all agreements and obey the laws, competence and care in conducting the experiment and examining the data, openness in sharing results, respect for participants, colleagues, property, and intellectual property, including avoiding discrimination, confidentiality in sharing information, including secrets and records, responsibility in publications, mentoring, and for society as a whole. This edition of the Mathematics video series briefly touches on ethics and research, but there is much more to learn. I encourage you to look up some of these experiments, read more about the subject, and watch some videos. At one point in your life, you may do some research or conduct some experiments. These examples and principles are important to consider. And remember, I leave you with this quote. Albert Camus said, a man without ethics is a wild beast loosed upon the world. Have a great day.